Join the New Zealand Alpine Club today and be a part of New Zealand's proud mountain community, supporting adventure since 1891. Membership benefits include discounts at our extensive network of huts nationwide. A range of courses and learning opportunities for aspiring climbers, led by the country's best instructors. A subscription to The Climber, New Zealand's only magazine devoted to climbing, as well as the New Zealand Alpine Journal. Travel insurance options allowing for climbing and other adventure activities not covered by standard policies. Perfect for your next adventure abroad. Plus, New Zealand Alpine Club membership also grants a variety of discounts at ski fields, climbing walls and outdoor retailers nationwide. Leadership and community for all who enjoy and wish to protect our magnificent crags and mountain spaces. The New Zealand Alpine Club, a voice for New Zealand's mountain lovers. Join us today. For more information, visit alpineclub.org.nz. The much-anticipated 8th edition of the Arthur's Pass Guidebook is now available to buy. Head over to alpineclub.org.nz to get your copy and start planning some adventures. Next week's virtual club night, we have Graham Zimmerman joining us live from the US. He'll be sharing with us the story of his first ascent of Link Saar, one of the world's most sought-after peaks and how we can start thinking and planning for expeditions for 2021 and beyond. This week we have a special book combo deal by both the Avalanche Awareness in the New Zealand Backcountry and Backcountry Ski Touring Guidebook for the special price of $56. That's a saving of $29 compared to the usual RRP. Join the New Zealand Alpine Club today and be a part Good of... Good evening everybody, wherever you're tuning in from. Welcome to this, the third... NZAC Virtual Club Night. Um, I'm your host for this evening, Jazz Morris, based here in uh, the Quarterdeck, Mount Aspiring National Park. And um, very delighted to welcome you to uh, this evening's talk um, by Anna Keeling. Um, before we get into her talk, I'll just be giving some uh, club announcements and um, a bit of information about what the NZAC has been doing now that we've shifted from um, Alert Level 4 to Level 3. Um, for those of you who are watching us from New Zealand, of course, you know exactly what that means. Um, but to, to kick things off, um, some general club announcements. Um, now, the Mountain Safety Council has launched a new website that is aimed at telling you all about the outdoor activities um, that are permissible under Alert Level 3, um, because obviously we're aware that um, things are now somewhat more um, acceptable than they were a week ago. Um, and so you can go to covid19outdoors.co.nz, that's covid19outdoors.co.nz, um, for what is a um, very clear, very well um, put together um, guideline on different types of outdoor activities you might be wanting to pursue under level three and whether or not uh, they are kosher within the law. Um, now, secondly, in terms of announcements for this evening, um, the um, New Zealand Alpine Club's shop, you'll be aware, is back online and, and shipping out again um, all items from the NZAC online store. And in conjunction with this talk is a special until next Thursday only on the uh, a, a combined order of the, um, uh, the Ski Touring in New Zealand guidebook and the New Zealand um, Backcountry um, Avalanche Awareness uh, Guidebook or, or Manual, um, and you can get both of those books for the combined price now of $56. Um, I think it's about $7 to ship, but um, either way, you're saving about $30. I, I jumped on that special as soon as um, I saw that email in my inbox today, so I um, encourage you to do the same. That offer for $56 for both the um, Avalanche Awareness and the Backcountry Skiing Book is available until next Thursday. Um, and in keeping with guidebooks, uh, the new Arthur's Pass guidebook, which was um, had its release stymied by the whole lockdown business, um, is now shipping and is, I believe, arriving in people's letterboxes already. 
um, those of you who've ordered that. So we, we thank you very much for your support of the Alpine Club at this time. That is a magnificent new guidebook, and especially if you're in the Canterbury region, that's going to be a, a, a real Bible to plan your trips from. Um, so I encourage you to get over to the NZAC website and um, look into the new uh, Arthur's Pass guidebook. Um, now, finally, uh, in terms of announcements, looking ahead to next week's talk, we have um, the very well regarded uh, Kiwi American mountaineer Graham Zimmerman, who is going to be giving us a talk um, at the earlier time of 5 p.m. Um, next uh, Thursday. So that's not 8 p.m. like tonight, that's 5 p.m. next Thursday. Uh, and he will be uh, presenting to us about his expedition to make, which made the first ascent of Link Sar in the Karakoram last year, um, and probably the most significant ascent of 2019 um, by, by many people's reckoning. So that will be an outstanding talk. He's also going to cover planning for expeditions, um, and he's coming to us from the US, hence the, the earlier starting time. Um, but tonight's speaker, Anna Keeling, is also coming from, to us from the US, um, she's on mountain time, um, and over there that means it's about two in the morning. Um, so thank you very much, Anna, for um, addressing us this evening. We really um, appreciate it. Anna uh, many, will be well known to many of us in the New Zealand mountaineering scene. She's an IFMGA guide, um, and her enthusiasm for the mountains, general level of energy, and um, and so on is, is well known. Um, she's pretty hard to keep up with in the hills, um, and. She has um, very kindly agreed to um, get up at an alpine start for us um, and give us um, this evening's talk. Um, now, her talk relies on a few little resources and things which um, are available online. None of them will be new to many of you, but uh, we're going to put links to those resources. For example, the backcountry uh, code around um, you know, eti etiquette and good behavior on, on ski fields. We're going to put the links to those uh, in the comment section if you're looking at us um, on Facebook. Um, and as we kick into the talk as well, just a, a general bit of announcement about the um, process. Anna's going to give us her presentation and then we're going to have what we expect will be quite a good Q&A. We really encourage um, you know, lots of input from you. Um, and if you can log your questions uh, wherever you're watching us, um, Facebook and so on, and we'll do our best to kind of aggregate all those questions as they come in, and, and I'll be um, hosting those uh, with Anna. So <laughs> given that it's two in the morning, we better not keep her up any longer. Um, Anna Keeling, we'll hand over to you. Thanks, Jazz. Um, well, it's good to be in New Zealand um, for an hour or so. <laughs> Always uh, missing it. So tonight I just wanted to talk mostly about gear and process um, for getting into backcountry skiing. It's the potential for the ski areas to have limited openings this season is quite high. Um, there's like generally a lot of patrollers come from North America. They won't be able to come this year. So um, we're going to be needing to operate fairly independently in the backcountry. And it's really worth mentioning right now that there is really no such thing as slack country. It's either a ski area or it's back country. As soon as you step through that boundary, you're outside the jurisdiction of the ski area. And often, especially with the smaller ski areas in New Zealand, that, um, there's not enough staff. It's just not resourced well enough to come to your assistance. So you need to know um, how to operate completely independently, even though you may have accessed the back country from a ski area. So, I'm on this really wobbly chair. I could take a nasty fall, but I will move back to start talking about some of the gear we carry. Whoa, there it all is. I nearly fell already. Um, so, I want to start with the avalanche tools. The avalanche transceiver, shovel, and probe. So, and the pack to put them in. It's extremely important that you know exactly that you're carrying these three items, you know their history, you know how to use them, and that you know where they are in your pack. So they need to be easily extracted from your pack. And it takes quite a bit of practice. Rescue practice is a really good idea. And um, send any questions through as I speak to send them through um, whatever chat method you have. Um, but at the risk of 
um, promoting my industry as a mountain guide, it is really worth taking an avalanche class this season. And I've sent um, a list of the avalanche providers, also uh, from the Mountain Safety Council, endorsed providers by the Mountain Safety Council. And um, we a great thing to do is to start your season um, with a class so that you know how to use these avalanche tools. You know how to deploy and use your probe. You know how to search with an avalanche transceiver. You know what battery power your avalanche transceiver operates best at. Um, other essential gear that I almost always or always carry for backcountry skiing is a first aid kit. This is a fairly generic guiding first aid kit. It can be a little bit smaller, but at a minimum, you probably need a, um, some slings of tape and um, blister repair kit. Um, I always carry two sets of I wear goggles for the down, glasses for the up. If you ski at the ski area in a helmet, you want a helmet for the backcountry. This is a fairly generic sort of um, black diamond helmet that is used for both um, climbing and skiing. So it's a good one for someone like me. Water bottles, be sack. Repair stuff, multi-tool, duct tape, other useful repair stuff. Remember, I send questions about gear and rubber, rubber straps, really useful for all kinds of things, repairs and so on. Um, various PLB systems, I've got a spot messenger, and I also own an inReach satellite. Text up, very useful. Never leave home without the headlamp. The day you go without your headlamp is the day you end up in the dark. Always have a headlamp, every member of the group, sunscreen. I always carry two pairs of gloves because I'm digging around in the snow. So a warm set of gloves and then a lighter set of gloves that I can tour in. Hats and buffs. And food. And food. I often carry food that I don't really like, like this sort of artificial type food. I always have this on me, so there's always a chance for a snack. I've always got something that's going to be lasting in my pack, and I keep um, various types of food around in my pack. I have a little bit of my first aid kit, a little bit of my repair kit, that kind of thing. Um, then, as far as the skis and skins and so on, it's very much personal preference. And this is possibly where people have the most questions around gear. Is, is there a message from NZAC? What is the question? I'll come back to that in a little bit. Talking about um, bindings is probably one of the biggest questions. And on my... I have a blog on my website, which is anakeelingguiding.co.nz. I have one post that talks about frame versus, versus um, pin bindings. Now, I don't have skis with a frame binding. All I have is an old frame binding here. This is a frame binding. This is a Fritchie Diamere frame binding. The whole frame lifts off the ski when you tour. And this is quite a lot like a regular binding, like a backcountry, um, like a front country binding, a ski area binding. Now, for guides and those of us who are always seeking to go, travel lighter, we have the tech binding. So tech binding has two holes for the, or pins that fit into holes in your ski boots. And this is a much lighter setup than the frame binding. Um, I see a lot of people these days skiing with these in the ski areas, myself included at times. Understand the limitations of these for skiing in the ski area. This is not a binding that's, um, it's a very strong binding, but it's not developed for aggressive ski area skiing. It's not really developed for jumping. I mean, you can handle a little, but especially for New Zealand where we ski on quite a lot of, dare I say, hard snow, 
um, this binding will start to wear out. The the uh, springs will start to wear with time if you use them a lot in this area. But for backcountry, they're gold. So brake system locks when you step down, and you can um, takes a bit of time to get used to it. But once you do, you won't go back. It's significantly lighter. Uh, but if you're looking for a one quiver, one type of binding ski setup, then there's several of these types of bindings. This is a combination of the pin step in with a heel piece that's more like the train binding, but with a pin front. So it's a better compromise perhaps between um, that front country ski area, back country continuum. So this one is the uh, Fritchie um, Tecton binding and um, the Kingpin is a similar type of binding and also the uh, Denefit Beast is another one as well. And one of the resources I've put forward is um, just to do some gear research on outdoorgearlab.com in terms of what kind of bindings or what kind of skins or what kind of skis you should get um, for your ability. Um, I've already put the skins on. These are my these are my skis. These these skis, I bought them for the colour, really. <laughs> um, I'm really into lime green. And but th what I like about this type of ski is it's a fairly versatile one. It's 102 millimetres underfoot. So quite a good all-rounder in terms of like powder or crud. I like it because it's quite a straight. Ski, it's quite an ordinary shape ski. It's got no real bells or whistles. And so um, this is a little bit on the heavy side for guiding or, um, you know, I wouldn't do a symphony on skis type of trip on um, this particular ski. But for an all-rounder, I can ski um, at the ski area and then I can also ski in the backcountry with this. And I also use a fairly heavy skin. So skins match the skis. And one of the most frustrating things um, with changing skis is as you change the width of your skis your and your bound to it as you change skis, you're going to need to change skins as well. So the skins are adhesive, fix onto the base of the skis and allow you to climb up the hill. You then at the top rip the skins off, fold them in half, put them in your pack or in your jacket and uh, then you can ski back down. Modern skins retain their adhesiveness really effectively. Um, they don't need to be dried in drying rooms even, they're nylon, they dry out quite quickly. And they are incredibly versatile, but they do need to be taken care of as well, kept clean and so on. Um, I've got a couple of different skins here. This is a lightweight. I, I, live, I live just like six black blocks up from um, the Black Diamond factory, so that's why I've got so much Black Diamond stuff because I just go down there and buy it. Um, these lightweight skins, uh, I love them for the packable size, but these ones are more durable, easier to take on and off. So these orange skins go to my green skis. And then my other skis I have here is... A type of ski that I would find more versatile in New Zealand, just in that it's um, quite a narrow waisted ski at 88 um, millimetres. And once again, um, with a pin binding, this is, a, this is my lighter setup. This is my setup that I use for ski, uh, for big ski tours or ski mountaineering here. So the, these two skis, this orange ski and then this ski here, uh, the two pairs of skis that I use here in North America, and I have no other skis. And I also have two pairs in New Zealand, and I have no other skis. I only have backcountry skis. I don't have um, any ski area skis. So whenever I ski at the ski area, which is sometimes, I'm very aware of the limitations of my pin bindings, and I never ski very hard or fast. Um, also attached to this ski, I have a ski crampon, And an extremely useful tool uh, for the New Zealand ski touring paradigm. And if you've got the choice to buy them, really 
good to use. They um, are used in conjunction with the skin. So I haven't got skins on these ones right now, but they're used in conjunction with the skin to just give you more purchase as you climb up the hill. And because we have the frequent firm conditions in New Zealand, this is a really useful tool. But at the same time, you've got to be careful with ski crampons because they give you um, additional confidence that uh, maybe even overconfidence and end up, you can end up um, in places you wouldn't um, want to be in steep sided slopes, being able to skin further than you would expect. And so it's really important to always look ahead and anticipate the train above. Again, if you've got questions, just send them in um, and um, I'll be answering them all at the end. Um, poles, I use an adjustable pole, but I never actually adjust the length unless I'm going to put the pole on my pack and carry it. Regular ski poles are fine. Everything is well to avoid small baskets. You need to have a basket for the powder days. Talk about more, um, more about powder what days shortly. I've also got a pair of my, um, my son's shorter skis and this is this Fisher Ranger is a fantastic ski as well for New Zealand. You can see a bit of a theme here that I prefer a narrower ski, like about 100 millimetres underfoot and less um, for both Utah and for New Zealand is my preference. But at the same time, I've been skiing since I was four years old and I've skied something like 65 seasons by my last count. So I can um, easily ski a skinny ski. I have... Um, the time, I put the time in. But this little ski is a really versatile um, just for its weight, for its width, and also for its length at 155. It's quite a good all rounder. The length of ski that you choose definitely is quite. The, the, the length and width of ski that you choose or its its configuration is very dependent on personal preference and also your size and weight. But to a very large extent, it's about your ski ability. And one thing I wanted to throw out there now, and I'll re-emphasize it later, is that it's, and I've got some tips on my um, whiteboard here, is that, that your ski or riding snowboarding ability needs to be, at the minimum, a strong intermediate. And when I say strong intermediate, I mean you may not look pretty, but you can ski everything on a ski area. Uh, so, like, for the backcountry, you need to have a certain amount of confidence in your skiing and control. Confidence and control in your skiing or snowboarding. And when you go to put a pack on, and you put these pin bindings on or a frame binding, and I'm going to talk about boots in a second, it's maybe a softer boot, the whole configuration can feel quite different to what you might be used to riding in on your regular days. And for that reason, I can't emphasise strongly enough that it is important to try the gear before you go, test it on the carpet, and where possible, take your pack out and your backcountry gear and ski the ski area with that backcountry gear. If, if you're one of those people who has two quivers, lucky enough to have two quivers. A lot of people will just be the one quiver kind of set up like I've got here. Now, speaking about boots, I, this, once again, I'm, I like to keep it simple and because I'm commuting back and forth twice a year between Utah and New Zealand, I look for a boot that is robust and fairly durable, comfortable. This is a specialised ski touring boot by um, Fisher. It has a, a dedicated walk mode. Um, the, the adjustments are different. Walk mode and ski mode. So I um, flip it forward for walking and I flip it down for skiing, this little lever here. And there's a lot of room for adjustment within the buckles to allow um, walk, um, a comfortable walking mode. In these, when you're using tech bindings, you need to have the little holes 
to fit the pins into. So the skis can fit, the boots can fit into the pins. It takes a bit of practice to get them in, but um, is, um, once you've got it sorted, it's really effective. So once again, this is the only boot I own. And uh, they get, <laughs> I've only had two seasons, I'm looking pretty rough, but no, I should get another four or five out of them. That's my plan. And then another thing I want to put forth is actually, this is my son's, and what he's got, and that once again, this is a sort of versatile situation, is that he's got a boot that has a dedicated hike mode at the back. So you, if you're not doing a lot of backcountry skiing or you're just going to try it out, having a boot with a just a hiking or walking mode can be really nice. Um, because you can use it for both that country and the ski area, front country. So I'm sure there'll be more questions about gear, and I'll come back to that. Um, my intention was never to talk too long, but to put it forth to questions, because I'm sure you have quite specific questions for getting into back country skiing. Um, Clothing, I have a selection of clothing here for the New Zealand ski tour. I think it is really important that you have waterproof layers, pants, that you have your underlayers, your thermal, you have socks that you've tested. Blisters are quite common. It's good to take up prophylactically for backcountry skiing. And where you tend to get blisters is, oh, look, there's one right there, a callus on the inside of the heel. And then a mid-weight layer as well. The all-important layer that I insist that absolutely everybody brings is some kind of down layer because if one person in your group gets hurt, everybody gets cold. So everybody should have a minimum some kind of down or synthetic down layer to put on. If, uh, if someone gets hurt, we can all be warm. I also carry in my gear a few um, hot packs, like, like hand packs or um, hand warmers or um, body warmers or whatever if somebody got hurt again. And the, for the same reason I carry the baby sack, I can pop somebody into the baby sack. As a guide, I often carry a tarp with a bothy bag, but um, for the recreational ski tour, something like this very lightweight um, booby bag works fine. Now, again, send your questions forward as you see fit, and I will endeavour to answer them. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit, here's my speaking notes, about the know before you go element. So we've got some excellent resources in New Zealand for learning how to get into backcountry skiing. I urge you all to go onto the New Zealand Avalanche Advisory website. Um, and it's a world-class website, a lot of great information, and some great resources on like Avalanche mm -hmm. education and um, providers and you know where to take classes, options for um, avalanche classes. But a few things that I'll reiterate, that it is, as I say here, ski and riding ability are important. At a minimum, you want to be a strong intermediate, which means you can ski, maybe not prettily, or ride, maybe not prettily. You're not looking that great, but you can go everywhere with confidence. Fitness is important. At a minimum, you want to be able to hike uphill 300 to 500 metres to get enough out of it, but to also have enough stamina to get through the day and stay warm and help it. Um, if you're going to take an avalanche class and you're going to learn to use the avalanche rescue tools, the transceiver shovel probe, and you're, ve you're venturing into avalanche terrain, then you really owe it to yourself and your friends to know how to do CPR. So take a CPR class. It's not that hard and it doesn't take that long. When you go onto the Avalanche Advisory, you can also use the weather forecast, become, and I've put that on the website as well, oh, that, that's uh, for the resources, is be familiar, and I'm sure everybody at Alpine Club is extremely familiar with looking at the uh, weather forecasts. And uh, make it home, 
hashtag make it home. So make sure you tell someone where you're going and when you get back. Some ski areas have a sign-out procedure. Um, if that's the case, uh, you may forget to tell them and you might need to call them, ring, ring them up when you get back and say, hey, you actually we're back. Um, respect. Now, this is a really big one. It's really easy to go out in the backcountry and go, oh, someone's I shouldn't be doing that, I shouldn't be doing this, and being a little bit naggy, and I've done it. <laughs> I'm guilty as charged. But we're all like this current situation with COVID-19, and then I'm giving a talk from Utah at 2 in the morning, and we're all kind of at home, that we're all in this together. And when we're backcountry skiing, that group you just asked could be your rescue. So be nice, be polite, take turns. You know, you can get into kind of competitive frenzy. Like, let's face it, powder snow is a scarce resource. Like, even living here in Utah and skiing as much as I do, sometimes I still get powder fever too, and I get plenty of powder. So... You've got to take that kind of step back and keep it under control. So another area of respect is not just the other users, but the ski area. So in New Zealand, unless you're going into the big mountains like Auraki or um, big areas where you might fly or do a long walk in or a long drive in, say, such as up the Cass, then for the most part, you're going to be passing through one of our ski areas. And I cannot stress how important it is to keep a good relationship with the ski area staff and respect the closures of the ski area. A couple of times I've seen people go up from Porter's ski area in Canterbury up to the top of the Allison Peak, go into Crystal Valley, then come back up and then try to get back into the ski area through the closed bluff face and a couple of times I've seen people take slide for life sliding t like what 650 metres from the top of bluff face to the bottom uh, uh, no, a lot of skin gets lost, maybe even a life, not cool, know where the ski areas are closed and respect that, speak to patrol before you go, I know that patrol can seem I was a controller, I hope I wasn't intimidating but I might have been and uh, they're not intimidating people, they're lovely people. So speak to patrol before you go. Um, learning is forever. I will never stop learning about snow and I will never stop learning about human behaviour and I'll never really stop learning about my own behaviour in the outdoors. It's an incredibly uh, challenging environment. So keep an attitude of, with an open mind, open to learning and open to communicating with other people. Um, not shaming and blaming other people um, for what they're doing or their um, shortcomings. But be open to maybe getting information from other people, asking conditions. What did you see? I saw you digging a pin out there. What did you see? What did you get for um, results on your tests? And the more you can find out, the more you notice, the more information you have. A big one with the etiquette within a, um, a popular backcountry area is please don't hike up the down, whether that's skinning or boot packing. Try to go around the most low angle route. The absolute time you do not want to get caught in an avalanche is while you're going up. Reason being that if you're skinning, whether on a split board or on snowshoes or on um, ski touring gear with skins, backcountry ski gear with skins or tallymark skis with skins, you are much less agile. You're way less able to get out of the avalanche than you would if you were actually able to slide. So going up a down route is putting yourself into avalanche terrain and putting yourself at risk. And um, there's always the, the chance that somebody drops in on you without seeing you. So please... Use established uproots, and if you're not sure where they are, just ask. Often, when you leave the ski area, if the uh, backcountry is visible from the ski area, then the patrol will be able to tell you where the common uproots are. Use the guidebook, the uh, Shane Orchard guidebook that's available as a special in conjunction with Penny Goddard's um, Avalanche Awareness in the New Zealand backcountry. They're available in combination on special until next Thursday through the Alpine Club, and they're fantastic resources. Kiwi Authors, Kiwi Terrain, fantastic, really beautiful books and uh, really well done. Um, 
um, especially the guidebook by Shane. So get, get back by that. And then always, if, there was, if nothing else, my, my word of advice is constant vigilance. Know who is around you. Know what's above you. Know if the slope that you're on, even if it's low angle, may be attached to something steeper and somebody else may come down that steep slope. So use safe travel protocols. Take an avalanche class, learn what safe travel protocols are. Pay attention. The learning never stops. But it's a fantastic environment and uh, we are lucky to have some great access to backcountry skiing in New Zealand. But understand, the minute that you step out of that ski area, you're in the backcountry. And you're on your own, effectively on your own. And I think that this season, more than maybe any before, um, this is really important to keep in mind. You step out of the ski area boundary, you're on your own. Even if you intend to come back in the ski area boundary, you're, you need to be able to be capable of self-rescue of your group. And you owe it to yourself, your family, your friends and your partners to know how to use your avalanche safety equipment. So it's really good to practice once in a while. In fact, you can practice on the beach. You can start practicing now. Um, a couple of other things that will come up on the resources is the uh, Federated Mountain Club's um, Backcountry Access Guidelines. Please familiarise yourself with those. And some extra information I checked in with um, the Tom Harris at the Mountain Safety Council and he just emphasised similar things on getting avalanche training, checking the forecast, and realised the avalanche advisories may be less confident this year with fewer people in the field. And that um, the public can submit avalanche observations as well, being self-sufficient. And then um, please support the local snow sports industry. If you can buy, uh, if you're needing to buy new gear, um, there's plenty that you can buy secondhand in New Zealand. There's a fair amount. But if you are buying new gear, support local shops. Um, they could really do with a bit of love right now, I'm sure. So rather than ordering from overseas, if you could try to support uh, local shops in your um, area, that would be fantastic. We're just trying to keep the profession going here. And if you want to take an avalanche class, um, I just recommend, recommend uh, my colleagues at the New Zealand Mountain Flights Association. Lots of people are giving, um, will be giving classes this year and uh, they've got excellent avalanche training. A lot of them have trained overseas. So do that. If snow is the question, Terrain is the answer. That's a quote from uh, Avalanche Forecaster here in Utah, Drew Hardesty. If snow is the question, terrain will be the answer. So you need to learn what is avalanche terrain and what is not. Okay, I can take some questions. Fire and through. Jazz. Thanks very much, Anna. Um, quite a few questions came through, as you might expect. Thank you very much for uh, an outstanding introduction. I think um, a lot of people will, at whatever level of experience, will have got a lot out of that. But clearly there are a few more things people would like to pick your brains on, and it's not very often um, they get to ask an IFMGA guide um, for free. So um, clearly people are wanting to make the most of that. Um, so some of them are quite gear-related. Some of them are quite, um, you know, uh, specific to you know new zealand scenarios that probably you're not having to deal with over in the us quite so often so that's all that's all good um first one is um do you have particular suggested brands for things like avalanche transceivers or are they all made to similar standards um they're all, they're all on a that's a great question thank you um they're all made to similar standards um there's a lot of different brands out there um Places like, why well, it's giving a plug for my business partner, but places like Chill and Christchurch will sell the whole package, Transceiver Shovel Pro. Um, BCA is fantastic. Um, the new Black Diamond Transceivers I've heard are great. I haven't really used them. I use the Mammut um, Pulse myself. It's a guide transceiver. It's quite um, quite involved to use, though. It has quite a lot of functions. Um, Autovox is still putting them out. They've had some hit and miss. Arva's great. You know, there's a lot of great brands, and they're all made to the same standard. They're all, they all use the same, um, the same um, kilohertz and um, 
So, yeah, they're all inter interrelated. They all can be combined. doesn't matter what people are using. The trick is to know how to use yours really well. And another trick is to actually know how to switch off, on and off your partners. And the other thing with transceivers is always checking them before you go, doing transceiver checks before you go to check the functions are working properly. I think, yeah, great, great point. So I've um, chopped and changed myself a few times over the years, and it's um, it's definitely not the same that, that, you know, a modern digital three antenna transceiver is going to operate in exactly the same way as another. I've had to learn the, the, the quirks of my one, so it does, it yeah, does take a lot of practice. And actually, that is a really good point, is that one thing that I emphasise is avoid buying secondhand transceivers unless you know exactly their history. Mm. You should probably buy them new because the thing is, like, hands up who can hold their breath for four minutes while somebody rescues you and digs you out. You need to know that your transceiver is working really well. And I, mm. I, I think that it is actually important to use a triple antenna beacon. Mm. That is the modern standard. Good one. Um, yeah. So uh, another question from Annie who's asked, would a season of skiing, and I think she means ski touring, be enough to build skills for mountain approaches? Not necessarily the technical ski descents, I don't think she's saying, but um, no, so this is like for I a lot of ski touring skills and, and mountaineering skills, I guess. Yeah, yeah. so mountaineering. Um, so one thing I have always emphasised as well is that um, backcountry skiing is not a way to get better at skiing. The only way to get better at skiing is to buy lift tickets, Sadly, buy lift tickets. Well, no lift tickets, great. But you need to put the time in skiing or snowboarding in order to safely go in the backcountry. That's why I keep emphasising the strong intermediate. So would one season, well, you'd have to put in a good season, I think, to be confident. Because when you think about it, mountaineering approaches, um, is you're going up to a to steep terrain, you might be going up some kind of apron that's going into a kulwa. You need to be thinking about where are you going to leave your skis, understanding sort of avalanche problems because you're climbing up into the avalanche problem when you're uh, mountaineering. So a season, if you went for it, is probably reasonably realistic but you will need to put some time in you're going to need you know 40 days yeah good one um so someone's asked uh, another gear related question what is a piece of gear that you never go touring without you mentioned the down jacket is that it or is there another one down jacket, but you can't go ski touring without your skis right yes <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah Certainly. okay yeah. Or your snowboard. <laughs> um, but, yeah, the down jacket's an essential piece. Um, I never go without my Transceiver Shovel Pro. <laughs> Good answer. Because imagine if I got an avalanche or I saw someone get caught in an avalanche. It would be embarrassing, wouldn't it? Oh, sorry, I can't help you. So <laughs> Transceiver Shovel Pro. And sometimes, even though we, we don't advocate for riding alone, uh, you know, I have the experience yet to ride alone, and even then I will take a Transceiver. I will mm -hmm. wear a Transceiver turned on. So at least my family can find my body. Right. And I yeah, actually anticipate the, a question I was going to ask from uh, from Andrew. Um, it's actually the next question in the lineup. So well done on anticipating that. Um, what are your thoughts on on going backcountry solo? Is there ever a time and a place? Yeah, I, I think there there is a time and place. It's going to depend on your ability, your experience levels, and the avalanche hazard rating for the day. And then it's going to depend on the terrain you choose to go in. Um, you know, I I do go alone, and but I think that I have the experience and the ability to go ski touring alone. I still carry the avalanche safety tools, and I'm very aware of the um, hazards. But I think that going alone um, for anybody uh, with limited experience is not an option. What you need is that ability to communicate with your partners and that back and forth communication, like two heads is better than one. Like that, that team approach to decision making is really important. And alone, you don't have that. It's just kind of you inside your head. So alone is okay in certain circumstances with certain abilities and certain like, avalanche hazards, but know your limits. 
Good summary. Um, Marcus asks, um, how do you go about doing a tour um, on a place like the Tasman Glacier um, without having to necessarily pay for a guide? This is a bit of a tricky question for a guide. You got, you're going to say, obviously, get a guide. I mean, that's, that's you know, clearly everyone should just do that, right? Um, that, but well, he raises a point, right? We're, you know, Kiwis want to get out and, and get experience and, and think about tackling these kind of bigger um, places by themselves. What's the kind of pathway there in your mind? Um, that, that is a fantastic question. And the first time I ever went up the Tasman um, ski touring, I went with Caroline Ogden, who's another IFMGA guide, in about 1991 or something. And we didn't take any guides. We just went, the two of us, and we flew up in like a Cessna and then we stayed at the hut. But we were lucky enough to run into Sean Norman and Marty Bear. And Sean said, right, you two, um, this will be a good first objective. Why don't you go on Traverse Oxygen and Diamond take your skis? And we went and we, they would give us suggestions and we would go and do it. And um, I think that the vast majority of New Zealand guides are pretty friendly and approachable. So you can sort of often get some information from guides if they're not too busy or stressed. <laughs> um, and then, but really... The fundamental of going up somewhere like the Tasman is understanding the best time of year to go there, understanding the weather forecast, mm. getting the avalanche advisory um, before you go up there. So you need to have some familiarity with glaciated terrain. Mm. So going with a more experienced friend or a mentor or going – well, I'm trying to remember how much experience I had when I went with Caroline – by the time I went up there, I'd already done a fair amount of um, climbing with friends. And, you you know, when you go up the Tasman, if you're already a mountaineer, then you already have um, the ability to rope up the glacier travel. And it's not really that different on skis. You're still wearing a harness. Um, you may still rope up. And definitely um, we really advocate roping up at um, on on the glaciers at certain times of year, whether you're on skis or on foot. And well, if you're on foot, you should always rope up. But if you're on skis, sometimes it's okay, sometimes it's not. And often what I find myself doing is roping up for the first day or so or on the first up, and then I'll go up the way I want to come down, even though I, I just advocated for not doing that. But, <laughs> um, but often, like, say, going up to um, the, the Grand Plateau or something, you might go up Glacier Dome and the first time you go up it, you might actually put a rope on while you leave the hut. And then once you've got a feel for where the crevasses are, maybe probing with your probe, um, when you come back down, you may elect to take the rope off because skiing downhill with a rope on sucks. Yeah. So, that. I'm into that. <laughs> We've got a couple more gear questions. Um so, any experience or opinion on glueless skins? I can't say I've heard of them. Yeah, um, the the Fisher ones. Um, they, I've had them on a couple of trips with people who have had them, and I've found them while they've worked fine here in North America, where the snow's soft most of the time. I've found them a little bit variable in New Zealand. I'd like to think that they've been improved, that technology has been improved, but I have found um, them to be a little bit squirrely. Mm -hmm. So an example of that is I had somebody on a Craigie Burn old route where they um, were using the glueless skins, and there were these funny kind of fish scale official ones, so almost like plastic and they be, they became really slippery everybody else was still skidding fine and this person was finding them really slippery and she had to put on ski crampons to get around them yeah right. outdoor gear lab good place to review skins because you know gear's not I, you know like like i said i'm kind of into one quiver <laughs> one set of boots and so do your own research and outdoorgearlab.com the gear freaks have got right amongst it and they've really tested that stuff. So check out those kind of websites for more information on what to buy. Cool. Good one. Um, and what do you think along similar lines of uh, kind of niche or halfway gear, um, what do you think of whippets? Oh, whippets are good. Yeah, I just use them for ski mountaineering. I have, I have some whippets. Yeah, we should probably actually explain what a whippet is. Um, maybe. Oh, yeah, whippet, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not that old. 
Um, so a whippet is a skeet hole like this. And I was going to put, bring one out actually, and then I decided not to because I didn't think I'd get asked about it. So I'm glad someone did. It has a little um, ice axe pick on it. I have one that just attaches. Black Diamond has made one that just attaches on the top of the ski pole. Very typical Black Diamond. They love their engineering. Um, other ones, you when you ski tour along for the day, you've got the whippet there. That it's good to have a guard on the whippet, like a plastic guard, so that you don't and don't accidentally fall on it. And that is definitely an issue with a whippet. But if you're doing steep skiing and you may have to self arrest, you have to weigh up like the consequence. You are you more likely to have to self arrest. Or is there a risk of stabbing yourself? Checks and balances. Always probability likelihood. You know, weighing up the, the likelihood of you falling and stabbing yourself versus the likelihood of you um, taking a slide for life fall. And in New Zealand, I've always thought that, and you know, there, there's lots of days that I carry an ice axe actually on my pack. Cool. Because slide for life conditions can occur after any kind of rain event. And I often carry foot crampons as well for the same reason. Yeah, or, or in New Zealand, you know, when the sun gets off a, a kind of east-facing slope that got warmed up in the morning, <laughs> can mm -hmm. it quite quickly change on your way. Hey, um, Marcus asks, what are your favourite type of gloves for wet slash cold conditions? Oh, good question. So I'm a bit of a fan of um, of leather gloves. And what I do is I just nick wax them and nick wax them. And basically, the nick wax sits by the fire, and every time the gloves come back, and I nick wax them again, rub them, and then put them by the fire. And so I'm, I, that's probably probably my preferred. But yeah. I always carry several pairs of gloves, and I'm not against using the old like rubber glove, <laughs> like yeah. uh, you know the old like fishing gloves. Um, I, I've used those in places like Antarctica. But in New Zealand, mostly, I just will use a Gore-Tex or a leather glove. So I carry a warm pair of gloves so that mostly stay in my pack, and then I'll have a, so like a mid-weight sort of leather type of glove that I wear most of the time, and then I'll have some glove liners that I can wear on really hot days so my hands don't something. Cool. Um, gear is definitely a theme of the line of questioning. Um, yeah, no, that's right. Yeah. How often would you take boot crampons when you're off ski touring in New Zealand? Great question. So, I mean, I'm thinking for those of you in the central North Island, probably a piece of kit that you'd be considering every single time you go out, especially if you're on the south side, you know, um, Tura or something like that. Um, but as a guide, and I primarily work in the Craigie Bend Range and Mount Cook, I am carrying um, foot crampons most of the time, but I carry a lightweight aluminium pair um, and, and my mindset behind it is that if I took somebody into terrain where they took a slide, a sliding fall, and I didn't want to ski down to them, I would have my ice axe and crampons and I could walk down to them. However, in North America, here in North America, I hardly ever carry ice axe and crampons unless I'm doing a, a ski mountaineering objective. But, yeah, I, I mean, I own lots of pairs of crampons and the, my aluminium ones, they travel back and forth to New Zealand with me and they're kind of essential because they don't weigh much, so there's not much excuse not to take them. And they're, when we have slide-for-life conditions, and often we have more slide-for-life conditions than we do avalanche conditions, then that's when I'm going to want to have those, potentially have those, especially as a guide, and especially for certain objectives that I do. Cool. All right. Um, Rod uh, says that he's had his ski brakes, his ski brakes fail to stop the ski, presumably they've come off his boot, um, on firm, in firm conditions. Um, and so he wants to know if you are in favour of the kind of strap things, you know, the boot to ski strap, um, you know, to stop the risk of losing your ski into a crevasse or something like that. Or, or do you trust the brakes? What's your preferred thing? Oh, that, that is another fantastic question. And I have seen um, brakes fail. Um, be careful with icing. So making sure, like, test your brakes before you put, when you make a transition from skinning to skiing, always just give your brakes a bit of a, make sure that, that they're working okay. If your brakes um, fail to deploy one time, go to a shop and get them adjusted. Like, mm -hmm. they might need to be bent out, um, like clamped out or something like that. Um, because it's definitely a manufacturing defect of some kind or, um, or you've 
ended up with a brake that's um, too narrow for the ski, and so it's sticking um, closed. And I am not a fan of um, of safety straps because if you do get caught in an avalanche, you don't want to have that anchor still attached to your foot. So ski straps or safety straps. Um, I also always this is always stuck with me. Like my mother. We back in the 70s when I was learning to ski at Porters, she had a really nasty crash with ski straps once and her skis flapped around and they broke her ribs. <laughs> so that's always put me off. That must have happened when I was seven or eight and it's, I've never forgotten it because <laughs> she was so, in so much pain. Yeah, it sounds nasty. Yeah, yeah. But more to the point, it's about having it's a type of anchor. It anchors your ski to your foot. But, I mean, at the same time, like, not all telemark bindings. And, I, you know, telemarking is a great way of getting around the backcountry as well. Not all telemark bindings will release. So it's understanding sort of limitations of certain types of, um, of gear. And the problem is I do, I have seen brakes fail to engage um, when you fall and your ski comes off. And if that happens even one time, yeah, just take that back to the shop and try and figure out what the problem is. Like, get a good look and say, okay, why did this happen? Is it an icing problem? Is it a spring problem? Yeah, good, good, um, really good point. And, and I think as, as people are, um, you know, making the transition from their old Fritchy touring bindings and things to the modern pin ones, you know, uh, depending on the models, they can be a bit different to adjust um, to get the brakes to engage when you come out of um, kind of uphill skinning mode. All right, yeah, and I think that's um, another thing that's really important is to, you know your gear, right? Eh? Yeah, um, you know your gear, yeah. yeah. So Chris wants to know, he's moved from NYC um, to New Zealand and wants to know if our backcountry powder, um, <laughs> he's in for a shock, um, is deep enough to warrant having um, a split board and skins or if um, for the likes of going up Mount Rapehu and then snowboarding back down, um, if you know crampons and snowshoes are good enough, I, I guess he's asking for the like how how much of a grovel can it be, and do you need that kind of touring ability, or, or are you going to get away with it? Oh, another fantastic question. I think you can get away with snowshoes just fine and carry. It's just the problem is when you carry the snowboard, it's heavy on your back. But if you've got the thinnest snowshoes, work quite well. Mm. You're quite effective. Um, Another thing um, with gear with uh, for splitboarders, and there's some excellent splitboard resources in New Zealand, like Christchurch's Split in Two. Um, he can split the board for you and um, create a splitboard for you if you have a, a snowboard that you're willing to. And um, that, and he's a great um, Richard's a great person to consult with if you're looking for um, more information on splitboarding. Um, another thing I've noticed is I we've got quite a few guides who are. Um, Split waters, so they're, they're snowboard guides, backcountry guides. And the vast majority, not all, but the vast majority are wearing, are using hard boots so, mm -hmm. so they can kick steps and so on. So my understanding, and I do snowboard a little bit, but not very much, um, is that soft boots are more fun, but hard boots are more of a weapon or a tool, if you like, because you can kick steps and it's often firm in New Zealand. So I just wanted to throw that in there that that if you're looking um, for a dedicated backcountry snowboarding setup, um, what I've noticed is that hard boots are kind of where it's at. And when I say hard boots, a lot of the people I've seen, what they're using is like a very lightweight, soft, backcountry boots, like um, ski, ski boots, like this, but much, much lighter, like a really lightweight data fit, like a, a ski mo boot, a ski mountaineering racing boot. Because yeah, good point. Because you can put crampons on those as well, whereas you can't really mm -hmm. on, a, on a snowboard boot necessarily. You can, but you've, you've got to get specialised crampons that are wide enough for that wide boot, yeah. Um, Guy wants to know if you um, have got with the Avalung. Oh, the Avalung and the Airbag, yes. Mm. Yes, didn't even bring them up. So I've not ever used an Avalung, although my husband has one. Um, my, from what I gather with an Avalung, that it has saved lives. Um, but what you need to do is you need to practice bouncing on the trampoline and try and get that thing in your mouth. Seriously, because that's what it's going to be like in a turbulent avalanche. So 
uh, or otherwise you need to ski down the slope of the avalanche in your mouth if you think it's going to avalanche. Now, I think of things like avalanche and um, airbag. Like an airbag, if I was um, doing a lot of ski patrolling in, um, in a big, in, on a mountain with a big snow safety program where I was doing a lot of ski cutting and bomb runs, um, that kind of thing, snow safety, a big snow safety program, then I would definitely, definitely be using an airbag. Um, um, did I, if I was um, doing a lot of heli ski, I don't do heli ski guide, I'm a backcountry ski guide. I have more time to make decisions when I'm backcountry. Um, having said that, I own airbags and in certain conditions, I will use the airbag, but um, at the same time, I'm always aware there's one of those heuristic traps that falling back into rules of thumb when we don't have enough information is the idea that you feel a lot safer because you have an airbag. And I have lost friends who deployed the airbags in avalanches and they still die. But the statistics out there are that if you're... Um, if you're doing a lot of sort of high-end riding, heli skiing, that kind of thing, then an airbag is a useful piece of kit. But it's very much about doing your research and um, personal preference. And like I say, I own them. I just don't use them that much because I have a lot of time on my extensive uphills to think about conditions and look around. As soon as you get out of a helicopter and ski or ride, you're, everything's happening quite fast. And so an airbag is definitely useful, more useful in that situation. And ditto for ski patrol. Cool. All right. Um, uh, it's looking to me like we're going to struggle to get through all the questions, but we'll, we'll, we'll battle on until, um, until you tell us you need to call it a night. Um, as a reminder to those of us, uh, to those of you watching, it's um, now three in the morning for Anna, who's over in Utah. Right. <laughs> she's pulling a pretty good alpine start. I'm sure she's used to it. Um, continuing with the questions, Craig wants to know if you always tape your heels for touring, because it sounds as though he has quite a miserable time, um, not able to get more than a couple of hours on the hill before um, his blisters become pretty bad. That sounds kind of annoying. What do you I reckon Craig go to a boot fitter to sort yeah. that out. Yeah, yeah, kind of that, that doesn't sound acceptable. Yeah, and think about your socks, like mm -hmm. nice, smooth socks. Pretty much all my ski socks have holes in the toes because they're the only socks I'll use for that. But occasionally I get blisters too. And um, I don't take my heels very often, but sometimes I need to. Just something changes and suddenly I start getting blisters. It's kind of random. But if you're getting them all the time and you're getting them within two hours, then you probably need to go to a boot fitter. Cool. Yeah, good advice. Um, any thoughts on, and you mentioned them, um, but what are your thoughts on marker kingpin bindings? Oh, the kingpin, the marker kingpin bindings are a fantastic binding. It's, um, yeah, there was a recall a couple of years ago because some pins were breaking. Um, so just double check, I would go to marker kingpin like online and just check the recall date. And if in doubt, just go to your local ski, um, ski shop and uh, they'll see you're right. Oh, um, it's, it's the hybrid pins at the front, kind of more like a traditional step in at the back, right? Yeah, they're similar to my um, my green skis here. Right. This is actually the Fritchie Tecton binding, but it's very similar to the Marker Kingpin. Um, I, I, it's a good binding for um, combining front country, back country. Although, just realise it's still not going to be as um, re, you know quite as reliable, say as a um, as a dedicated. Um, ski binding, but the beauty of these is that there's a DIN setting on both the front and the back, an adjustable setting for your weight so that the ski will release. Yep. The binding yep. will release. Yep. <laughs> the binding of the ski, yeah, that'll be bad. <laughs> um, so Dan asks, uh, what was he tells us, you've mentioned your son a couple of times, you've got some of his gear out. Um, and Dan is keen to get his um, his kids into the backcountry and um, wants to know what kind of considerations might be in the back of your mind as a parent when kind of trying to figure out if they're ready for it. Fitness, skiing ability. Um, he mentions rescue, which is an interesting point. Yes, super important. Um, fantastic question and uh, yet another. Thank you for all the great questions, everybody. Um so we've taken OB a few times, but when I say we, 
my husband, who is not a guy but a documentary filmmaker and, you know, a climber and skier and everything, um, we go as a threesome. So we have the backup anyway. Mm-hmm. So And we only have the one kid. So we've taken him up the Tasman, but um, um, I, I don't do as much. We don't go, we don't actually go that often. He doesn't, he doesn't love backcountry skiing. He actually thinks it's really boring because <laughs> there's not enough jumping. The kid is a phenomenal skier. I mean, he's like 13 years old and he's had 22 seasons as well. I mean, it's starting to sound like um, <laughs> don't refuse to make a kid ski that much. But he um, he does um, go backcountry once in a while and he's very aware of um, the rules. A lot of the time what's happened for me is I've not had childcare, so I've had to take him on avalanche courses. So he's osmosed a lot of information. So he knows how to do transceiver searches and he understands the avalanche um, ratings and things like that. But um, when it comes to the question of rescue, I would not be relying on children to do an effective transceiver search, probe and shovel. So you need to have more adults than you have children in order to go out. Um, occasionally, um, well, quite often we do youth courses um, at the clubbies down in Canterbury, um, you know, youth avalanche courses to skip because mo- mostly at the clubbies people are wearing transceivers every day and carrying shovels and probes. And so it's really good to get kids out learning about that stuff early on. But um, I have to say as a parent who backcountry skis, uh, I don't take my kid that often. And, you know, he's perfectly capable of doing 500-metre climbs. He just doesn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> all right uh, and i guess the question of um you know can my kid dig me out of a out of an avalanche kind of raises another question of like well you know what what kind of slope were you choosing to ski with your child as well eh so probably good to be even even more conservative and you know gather even more information before you yeah. before you get to that what are the conditions like mm-hmm. the avalanche hazard what is the avalanche problem on the slope that you're thinking of skiing. So um, if the slope is less than 30 degrees, then there won't be an avalanche problem because it's not avalanche terrain. If it's more than 30 degrees, then it's avalanche terrain. So you need to understand what the avalanche problem is. Good one. Um, So I'm going to be a little bit mean to some of the people who've asked questions because they're they're all good, but we're going to curate them and probably just take maybe three more. Does that sound good? Okay, yeah. Uh, uh, or what do you think? Can you, you, can you handle more? I can go for a few more. I'm, I'm, I'm cool. good. Cool. Um, so, <laughs> classic Kiwi question. Um, are there things to look out for buying secondhand skis? Oh, so, yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, sight unseen is a little tricky. I mean, it's not so much the secondhand skis because, you know, you can tune a ski and get it back up into action. But, um, but, the insides of the ski, if it's been mistreated, um, it, it may not be in, in great shape. You may not be able to see it inside a ski. But it's more like how well have the bindings been taken care of? You know, mm-hmm. are the springs still working? There's, there's quite a lot of moving parts in these. There's a bit of spring in here. Like, you know, how abused has it been? So, um, yeah, you just need to ask a few questions. How old is the ski? When did you buy it? How many days have you used it for? What did you use it for? Where have you been with it? Cool. Yeah. Then buy the we are usual questions. Yeah. Um, Alistair would like to know when you might rope up when you're skiing on a glacier. Um, I will rope up early season mm-hmm. when the snow bridges are not yet strong. I'll rope up in spring when the snow bridges are starting to sag. I'll rope up on any glacier I'm not super familiar with, and any glacier where I'm not super familiar with the, um, with the conditions for this year. Um, I might rope up in a whiteout because I'm not exactly sure where I am. Um, I, yeah, definitely in, in poor weather, I'm more likely to rope up. I would try to um, avoid roping up for downhill, but I've done it. So, yeah, there's lots of different conditions in which I will rope up. Any time that I'm worried about snow bridges or I'm feeling unfamiliar with the terrain, then I'll get the rope out. Cool. Yeah, I've had to ski roped up downhill in a whiteout and it was all the worst parts of the bible <laughs> it wasn't fun no. um penny talks about how she um a- as a routine um takes her hands out of the wrist straps on uh, when she's skiing downhill in the backcountry 
um, to like avoid tangling and um, you know all those kinds of things. Um, do you think that's a good idea? I mean, what are the? Yeah, I never ski. I never ski with my wrist straps on. Um, the only time I'll use my wrist straps is if I'm doing a long shoot, you know, a long flat shoot where I'm pulling for a long time. So it's pretty rare. I don't. It's for the tangling. If I got put in an avalanche, I would be able to ditch my poles. Cool. And I've had a lot of skiers' thumbs over the years too, and wearing ski straps makes it more likely. Pole straps, I mean, uh, makes it more likely to get that skiers' thumb. Cool. All right. A um, couple more re well, really good ones here. Um, Ashley wants to know some of the best places for beginners to go touring in New Zealand. Well, great question. So I think for um, some really great beginner terrain is like the Two Thumb Range down near um, Tekapo. Mm -hmm. um, the Craigie Burns, the only really easy place to go, I think, is Tar Basin um, for beginners. Um, but the thing is that you can actually, a, a good way to sort of get started with skinning and skiing down, as long as you go and ask if it's okay, is sometimes you can do it at the ski areas themselves. But you just have to ask first because you don't want a whole lot of backcountry skiers crowding um, where people have paid money to go and ski. So, you know, you wouldn't skin up the middle of the run. You want to go kind of, you know, off to the side, that kind of thing. Um, I also think, you know, Around Central Otago, there's some fantastic, like the Pisa range is a really great place to get started as yeah, well. I was going to say, some of those ranges are perfect. Yeah, just brilliant. Beautiful sort of rolling terrain. There's still some avalanche terrain in there, but it's um, it's often isolated. You just have to know that it's a slope step of 30 degrees. Cool. Um, another classic Kiwi question, because I think we've all encountered a um, super aggressive skin track when we've been out following someone else's um, trail. Uh, Pip would like to know your thoughts on the relative efficiency of a steeper skin track or kick turns in terms of you know saving energy and so on. Oh, fabulous! Yeah, yeah. So um, it's always a toss up, isn't it, in terms of fitness um, and ability? So I, you know, as guides, we're supposed to have like put in a skin track of fifteen degrees, no more, no less. But I actually will go, I'll put a skin track in as steep as people can kind of handle it practically because I, what I find is that um, the, the kick turn itself is often the most tiring part. So I'll skin a little steeper in order to avoid too much kick turning. But it depends entirely on the terrain. So, mm -hmm. you know, can you find effective platforms to just, um, just step around or make an AV turn instead of a kick turn? So I'm always being, I'm always like, it's really about the sort of big picture, the medium picture, and then the micro picture in terms of terrain and route finding. And I'll look at the big picture and go, okay, where am I going to go up to get to the top of this slope? And then I'll be like, medium picture, well, I need to get, you know, am I in the medium picture, like about the, the medium um, spectrum of the tour? And then the micro, it's like, where exactly do I want to put the skin skin track in? Where exactly do I want to um, kick turn? Do I have to kick turn? And that those kind of decisions are all those sort of micro terrain choices. And it just takes practice. But often I will go a little bit steeper, and we're talking about two or three degrees only, in order to avoid... Um, too frequent kick turns because my policy is that if you fall skinning because it's too steep or there's too many kick turns you're going to possibly do um, if you fall twice you're going to do one less run for the day because you're so exhausted getting up with your heels loose and a pack on your back and you can just end up really floundering and it can be quite scary too yeah not to mention like demoralizing <laughs> <laughs> um a quick question about gear and then we'll see how, how you're going. Um, can you talk about ski length and width for New Zealand conditions? Yeah, so I talked about that a little bit earlier. Um, so I think I, it's very much about personal choice and maybe what you're most used to um, skiing or riding on. Um, on your ski area days, but I'm a fan of a, a ski that's around 100 millimetres underfoot. I'm, now let's see, I'm um, 
166 centimetres tall and I weigh about 60 or 62 kilos. So I ski a ski, but I'm also an expert skier. I've been skiing since I was four years old. Um, I've been ski guiding for 22 seasons in a row right now. And I've been um, a ski guide since 1996. So, you know, <laughs> and I was also a ski racer. So I've got a bit of skiing behind me now. But for me personally, I like 100 underfoot and I like a ski that's about 170 or 165 centimetres to 175 centimetres long. But it's going to be different for different people. It's going to be different for your ski ability. Um, it's going to vary depending on your ski ability, your height and your weight. So you're weighing up all of those. Um, Airing on the side of longer is heavier and also more ski to move around and kick turns and so on. But a shorter ski is also a less stable platform. So it's a balancing act. The thing is that the best thing I reckon to do is if you're shopping around is to go to a reputable ski shop that sells, um, like a reputable, there's so many great ski shops in New Zealand. Go to a ski shop and they will give you a quiz on your ski ability, how you like to ski how big you are, you know, your size, and then they will come up with a, um, a range of different kinds of skis that might work for you. This is what I know, like, my local ski shop is Gnomes in Darfield, and that's very much what they do is plug out for Gnomes. Are you there, Ali? Lee? <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, it's, it's very much personal preference, but ski shops are well able to advise as well. Cool. And I would just go there. They're the experts. We've got a bunch of questions that have come through, and I apologise, we're not going to get through them all this evening. Um, I'm going to close with one, which is um, probably a perfect way to, to end the night. Um, and Hamish wants to know, what would you recommend is the best way to learn the skills to progress from ski touring um, to ski mountaineering? Okay, cool. Fun. Um, so you need to learn to climb. You know, when to get out the rope, how to use the rope. Mm -hmm. And so rock climbing helps with stuff like that, with that, those, you know, how, how to handle a rope, just starting to rock climb can help with that. Um, you'll need to know more about building snow anchors. So um, I would say that if you're a strong skier, you're doing some backcountry, you're doing ski touring, backcountry skiing, um, then something like a mountaineering course would be an effective way to blend the two skills of ski to backcountry skiing and mountaineering to become a ski mountaineer. So I would say take a mountaineering class. Good one. All right. TV, something like that. Hey, thanks very much, Anna. That's been um, outstanding. Are, are, are there any parting parting words of wisdom before you before we say good evening to you? Um, so these resources you've got, they'll, they'll, they're available to um, participants. Um, some resources on where I get information, um, the New Zealand Avalanche Advisory, and um, some words of um, like the, the backcountry guidelines for leaving a ski area put out by the FMC, uh, Dan Clearwater last year. So definitely um, use those. Um, take an avalanche class, never stop noticing, never stop paying attention in the backcountry. And um, I mean, at the risk of the repeated thing, but be nice to other people, be kind, be polite, be respectful to other users and to the ski areas. I can't emphasize that enough that we're all, um, we need to work together. And that party that just passed you, even if you didn't think that they were um, behaving that appropriately, if you get into trouble, they're going to be your rescue. So practice, practice with your rescue gear. And cool. uh, attention thanks very much hey and just to let you know um you know we've had people uh, tuning in from as far away as singapore um we've had a number of people say that they've run into you in the hills remember you fondly and just wanted to say hi i can't can't list them all but um hi let's <laughs> <you. laughs> that's pro i mean that's probably quite a few people in the mountaineering community by, by now right that you've run into <laughs> yeah yeah i'm the old day eh? i've been around a while Oh, it's super helpful though, and that's that's one thing that um, is, is we really appreciate. You know, you um, you've given a lot of your time. You've got up at two in the morning to talk to us actually earlier um, well, because we had some, some setup. Um, so thanks very much, Anna, for um, such a great presentation. Um, and to all of you who are um, watching, we're just going to have a few final kind of um, announcements before we close off for the evening. But just to say thanks very much, Anna, and um, I'm sure there's 
uh, several hundred people out there in the, the world who are um, clapping for you. <laughs> Unfortunately, we can't hear that, such as the way of um, the virtual club nights. But, yeah, thanks again, Anna. Cheers. Thanks, Anna. It's been a pleasure. Love um, being involved in the Alpine Club, being a member for a long time. So uh, it's a privilege. Thank you. Cool. All right. Well, just to remind you, um, my name's Jazz Morris, just based here in, in uh, Christchurch, not actually on the quarter deck, obviously enough. Um, but just wanted to say thanks for tuning in. Some quick announcements for you um, that you um, may have come across if you've been with us since the beginning. Um, the Mountain Safety Council have launched a website that tells you all about per permissible or, or kosher activities um, under our COVID Level 3 business. So that's covid19outdoors.nz, covid19outdoors.nz. Um, and the link will be in the comments um, on the Facebook page there. Um, one thing that if you've been inspired by the talk this evening uh, might be particularly appealing to you is that the NZAC are offering um, a combo um, on avalanche awareness in the New Zealand backcountry. That's a manual put together by Penny Goddard. Um, and Shane Orchard's Backcountry Skiing Guide for New Zealand. Um, both books are being offered um, at the combined price of 56 bucks, which is about $30 off. Um, and that deal is uh, on, in conjunction with tonight's talk, it's on for, for a week. Um, so you can get on to the Alpine Club website where um, everything is now shipping again from the online store, including the new Arthur's Pass guidebook. Um, finally, just to remind you about next week's talk, if you've enjoyed this evening's one, uh, we have Graham Zimmerman coming to us from the US to talk about the first ascent of Link Sar and the Karakoram. Uh, that talk will be at the um, earlier time of 5 p.m. next Thursday. Um, we weren't able to convince Graham to do a, quite such an alpine start as Anna, fair enough. Um, so 5 p.m. next Thursday, we'll look forward to seeing you then. Um, but for this evening, um, just signing off, saying thanks very much for tuning in. Thanks also to Francis Charlesworth from the NZAC. He's the program coordinator. He's been um, working away in the um, back room, um, keeping all of the tech up and running. He's been running all these talks um, pretty late into the night. So thanks very much, Francis. And uh, thank you to all who've tuned in tonight. We'll see you again next week. Bye-bye.